I love the starry sky. I always love the starry sky, and I'm sure you all do. It speaks directly to our soul, to our inner world. But I also am fascinated by the starry sky because it's fake. It's fake news. It's a collection of objects from different moments in time and places in space. And the only reason why we see it like we see it is that light is a little bit slow in carrying all these objects to our attention. And bottom line, it is impossible for us to empirically observe the universe and the starry sky as it is. Now, astronomers have to use their scientific knowledge and tools to still infer and imagine how the universe might look like at this moment. And they used to study the life cycle of stars, the laws of physics, just to understand how the real starry sky might look today. Well, this is a little bit like the people that try to regulate emerging technologies have to do. It's impossible to regulate artificial intelligence today by thinking of what is on the market now. Because by the time the rules that we try to craft would reach the market, well, the world will have changed. AI will have changed. So these rules will be already obsolete. So we need to use our imagination, or how some governments used to term this word and this activity, foresight, to make sure that we understand what might emerge as a risk or as an opportunity for AI going forward. And this reminds me of something that I studied when I was a kid in school many, many years ago, when I studied philosophy in high school, and I encountered, met for the first time, this fantastic guy, a pre-Socratic philosopher called Zeno from Elea, with a great mathematical mind. This guy thought that, and imagine a situation where we have Achilles chasing a tortoise. And his assumption is that Achilles will try to catch the tortoise by looking at where the tortoise is and running there. So Achilles will look at that place and will go there, right? And, but the tortoise, in the meanwhile, will have made those additional steps, and thereby Achilles will not catch the tortoise. So Achilles replicates this same approach. It looks at where the tortoise is and goes there, right? And the tortoise has made this additional little step. So Zeno from Elea logically concluded, perhaps a little bit theoretically, Achilles will never catch the tortoise, right? Well, it's the same thing with law and technology. Uh, we cannot just observe, as I was saying before, uh, with my uh, example of the starry sky, we can observe what technology is today. Oops. And the difference in uh, the Achilles and Tortoise example that we have uh, 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 with law and technology is that law is the tortoise, and Achilles is the fast guy running. The technology and the law actually has to adapt and use a lot of imagination and a lot of foresight and a lot of anticipation and a lot of agility to get where one day in a few years technology will have arrived. Now, in using the tools of foresight, many of our social scientists try to tell stories to build scenarios for the future, and I tried to do something like this a few years ago when I started a story, writing a story, uh, where I was telling um, the uh, uh, unfortunate fate of a guy that I called Ben, or Benjamin. This guy, Ben, one day discovers that he is terminally ill. He only has, unfortunately, six months left to live, more or less. This is what the doctor says. And a tech company approaches Ben and offers him a fantastic deal, free of charge. They say, Ben, if you share with us all the data that you have accumulated on social networks for all your life, if you share with us your journals, your diaries, perhaps if you enter an interview for three days for us, we will ask you what your political opinions are, what your best memories from your life are, um, what your favorite movies are, what your favorite songs are. Um, we will also film this interview and just to see what your facial expressions are, what your body language is, and perhaps we'll interview your family. We'll get to understand how do you live as a family. Well, when you pass away, uh, you, Ben, will be transformed into a replica. We'll transform you into a grief bot. And the grief bot of Ben will evolve like Ben might have evolved. It will age like Ben might have aged. It will perhaps change political opinions. 
like people normally do, might do. Statistically, it is possible. Ben might grow a beard or not. Ben will actually scrape uh, data from the external world and might also uh, learn from new happenings. So Ben, for example, might like a new movie that has come out after he passed away. He might congratulate a friend for a newborn. Might even be able to look at the picture and comment on that picture by scraping data from a social network. Ben will be able to advise his family when there's a new election and he will say, I would vote for this party or not. Well, and in my story, and I was feeling very creative, it actually became gradually clear that it is difficult to understand whether what Ben is saying to his family is algorithmically determined only, or there's a private interest behind, or someone who's pushing Ben to nudge his family towards buying a specific product, voting for a specific political party, and so on and so forth. Well, I was feeling very creative until one day I discovered that reality was going faster than my imagination. And this is when I had my epiphany in March 2020 when I saw for the first time uh, a documentary shot by a South Korean broadcaster that showed a mother celebrating the seventh birthday of her daughter in virtual reality, despite the fact that her daughter had passed away three years before. The daughter speaks and acts like a seven-year-old. She's been aged. The mother doesn't know what to think, whether she is meeting her daughter after she has been three years in a parallel world. She never died. But then she suddenly realize, realizes that this is not true, this is impossible. So she laughs and cries. She is desperate and excited. She doesn't recognize anymore what's real and what's fake. And that is one of the problems that we have today. This technology that we use to create the uh, seven-year-old uh, uh, daughter is the same that is used today to create deep fakes, to reproduce the appearance, the body language, the tone of the voice of public figures and private figures, as you saw from my example of Ben, depending on the data availability. And what happens today as we are witnessing the deployment of deep fakes in a war zone in Ukraine by researchers and businesses based in Belarus and Russia, we see that in these cases, and in many cases, the inability to distinguish what is real from what is fake can be a matter of life or death. But this is not the only case in which we increasingly are distancing from reality, what we call the epistemic risks of artificial intelligence. Uh, these people that you see on the picture are people that are working in Madagascar to make the promise of a fully automated checkout-free store possible. People enter in California in a checkout-free store thinking that AI will get exactly what they are buying, so there's no need to stop by and pay but indeed they are manually observing and correcting what AI gets wrong. They are paid on a week-by-week -week basis. They are paid decently for Madagascar living standards, but at the same time, what happens, the irony of this is that they are, from an employment perspective, digging their own grave. They are training a machine that one day will be accurate enough to be able to get rid of them, or most of them, because those systems always need some minimal retraining. Is this the labor and the work that we imagine when we think about sustainable development goal number eight, that among its targets has full and decent employment for everybody? Is this decent or are we slaves to machines, the data cleaners? And this is not the only example. Perhaps even more famous examples are cases in which we become the subject of an enormous process of data collection for private players in some countries and governments in others to collect all this information about us and build a score that tells us whether we are good citizens or good users or good participants to a social network. This is the example of the Chinese social credit scoring. A higher or a lower score determines whether you can access public spaces, public transportation, high-speed trains, fast-track lanes, or low mortgage rates, interest rates. At the same time, similar profiling artificial intelligence systems have been deployed in the Netherlands and in Denmark. So this is not just a Chinese story. Think about the Siri and the Glad Gladsaxe algorithms that have been respectively deployed and then struck down in uh, the Netherlands and Denmark.
So perhaps Yuval Noah Harari, the famous historian and writer, is not wrong when he says that the conflict between democracy and dictatorship is actually a conflict between two different data processing systems, and that AI is a little bit swinging the pendulum towards the latter, towards dictatorship. And perhaps it's also not true what people say that uh, data is a new oil. It is not a matter of how much data we are surrounded by. The matter is whether we trust this data. Think about the example of Ben. It doesn't matter how much information we get from Ben if we are his family. What we need to know is whether this information is trustworthy or not. And how do we build a trustworthy environment? How can we trust the technology? Well, the first thing that is needed, as I said already in my first two examples, is foresight. And there are many things that we see when we build scenarios about the future, but I want to mention just two. What we see about the future of AI, and based on current estimates, there are many similar estimates about what AI can add to global wealth by 2030, is that this is not just a global wealth created by AI, but it's a very unevenly distributed wealth. With some countries, China, North America, we Europeans getting the most of it, but the ones that are already lagging behind uh, really getting a very, very small share. The other thing we see is that we are not ready at the moment to really approach what is presented to us as the metaverse. Our inability to distinguish what's real from what's fake will reach a peak in the metaverse and will be put to the test in a dramatic way, in my opinion, if we don't build rules around the metaverse. We don't just need foresight, we need principles. And I had the honor of being a member of the high-level expert group of the European Commission, where we uh, discussed and defined the principles of trustworthy artificial intelligence. You see this listed there. Uh, and we also tried to operationalize those principles into a series of requirements. Now, these requirements today are the basis for the first ever proposal for a comprehensive uh, legislative framework, a regulatory framework for artificial intelligence known as the AI Act that the European Commission presented in April last year. But we need more than that. The AI Act is not going to solve all problems. And one of the things that we need at the moment, and the European Commission is starting work on this, is a charter of fundamental rights for the digital age, where we actually define what is the sphere of us beings that should not be touched, and what are the characteristics of us human beings that should not be affected or uh, damaged by the deployment of artificial intelligence. Not just principles, but outcomes. The Sustainable Development Goals, in my opinion, are still the most reliable and comprehensive framework for us to treat technology as a means to an end, as a means to a vision of society for the medium to long term, which is made of uh, people, planet, and prosperity in particular. So rather than thinking about maximizing AI, we think about how AI can maximize our well-being and the well-being of our planet. Not just foresight principle and outcomes. We need to understand that AI creates, in some cases, very high risks. In other cases, too high risks, such that we cannot really control or mitigate those risks. And AI, in other cases, create lower risks. Uh, rather than over-regulating the whole thing, all AI applications, we need to find a way to distinguish those uh, risky AI applications. And some of the examples that I made earlier in this talk, um, manipulation of human behavior, social credit scoring, in the proposed AI Act are for the first time ever considered as banned. While in China, they're actively practiced. And perhaps in the United States, through private means, they're also practiced. So how do we distinguish the risky and the less risky AI applications? And how do we make sure that we do this as AI constantly evolves? We need agile institutions. We have institutions that do not look like the ones that we have today. We need adaptive institutions, able to change their direction when things change. And finally, Europe certainly cannot go it alone. We need shared values at the global level. At the moment, and sorry to ruin your evening, what I see is that the best what we can achieve in global AI collaboration is that we might be able at the global level to uh, define the technical standards that back the deployment of AI, but in terms of policies, we're going to fork. The US and China, as I already hinted at, are not at the moment representing a sustainable and resilient example of uh, artificial intelligence and human together. So going back to where I started, to the starry sky, 
Well, I think what we need to preserve in our long AI journey is both the outer world and the inner world, is what Immanuel Kant defined in the Critique of Practical Reason as the two things that really define man and give admiration and awe to man, the starry sky above us and the moral law within us. At the same time, we need to fight hard to continue uh, preserving our ability to distinguish what is real from what is a representation of reality. And most importantly, we need to preserve our uniqueness as individuals rather than adhering to a standardized algorithmic model, our unique view of the starry sky, our right to be different, our right to view and describe the starry sky like nobody else does. Thank you.